At under 190,000 ringgit, the Volvo EX30 Plus is now the most affordable way to get into the Swedish brand. However, in this video, we're going to find out if that requires some degree of compromise or if it's just a really good deal. My name is Ayman Abdullah. This is Malaysian Motoring. This is our review of the Volvo EX30 Plus. Now, in Malaysia, the EX30 lineup starts with this, which is the EX30 Plus, and it's powered by a 69 kilowatt hour or 64 kilowatt hour usable nickel manganese cobalt NMC battery, which provides a WLTP rated range of 476 kilometers. Now, despite the relatively small battery, this car still produces 272 horsepower and 343 newton meters of torque, which means that 0 to 100 is completed in under six seconds. Well, under six seconds at that. Now, in terms of charging, there's an 11 kilowatt AC charger, which means that this car will juice from dead to full in about six hours. Now, in terms of DC charging, that's all the way up to 153 kilowatts peak, which means a 10 to 80% should take well under half an hour. It also has this weird walk away lock thing, so it keeps insisting that I'm not by the car, even though I'm standing right next to it. Now, the reason why even the base model can do well over 400 kilometers on the charge is largely down to its design. The EX30 uses a scalable product architecture that we've seen from other brands within the Geely umbrella, such as the Smart Lineup, as well as other vehicles within that space. But the overall design on top of the platform is an entirely clean, cheap design, which is why up front, you still get the sort of Thor's Hammer daytime running lights that we first saw from the EX90. You get a closed off front end here. And despite not having the usual grill, it still looks very much like a Volvo. Now, because these are full LED headlights replete with automatic high beam, there is no need for fog lights. And so they've done away with that. Instead, we're having this little piece of black trim that goes all the way across to emphasize the width of this car, while also integrating the air breathers on the front in order to smooth air flow over the front wheels. You also get a little bit of aerodynamics underneath toward the lower part of the bumper in order to help cool the battery and to cool the radiators that do various other things in this car. Now, the EX30 is the entry-level Volvo now, globally, and so that results in a very small footprint. The EX30 is actually considerably smaller than what you get from both the Smart Hashtag 1 as well as the Zika X, which is fine because if you wanted something bigger, you already have the XC40 and C40. Now, in terms of rolling stock, that's handled by a set of 19-inch alloy wheels wrapped in Goodyear Efficient Grip Performance SUV tyres, which are suitably high performance given the fact this car is relatively powerful, with that power coming from the rear wheels, not the front. As we move further down the side, you get these frameless wing mirrors, which I think look absolutely fantastic. You also get, as standard, this dual-tone roof design. Now, the roof of this car is always available in a contrasting colour, no matter which body colour you go for. As a result, the EX30 always looks very distinctive, especially out in the middle of the day. Now, it is worth pointing out that the eagle-eyed among you may spot this sort of card reader NFC type signal here. That's because this car comes as standard with two keys, although they're not really keys, so to speak. Now, you get a key fob, which is your typical Volvo item, but doesn't come with any buttons whatsoever. This just acts mostly as a transmitter. However, this car also comes with a key card. Now, we've seen this before when we preview drove the EX30 all the way up to Jandabai. And so if you have the key fob, you can just reach into the door handle and it unlocks. If you have the key card, you'll need to tap it on the B pillar for the car to unlock. And then you tap it again to lock the car afterwards. This is a surprisingly reliable system. However, it does require you to get the key out of the car and then put it on a specific pad inside the car to start it. Now, as we move further back, as you can see, you've got a little bit of EX30 badging here, which I think looks quite smart. And overall, the side profile of the EX30 does look pretty good. Now, I do challenge Volvo in one sense because they call this a crossover. I actually see it as more of a hatchback. This is more of a spiritual successor to the Volvo V40 in my eyes compared to a sub-sized C40, again, to me. But let me know what you think in the comment section below. Now, the back of the EX30 also sees that continuation of the design that we first saw or previewed in the EX90. So you now have the reimagined Volvo taillights now split into two different units, where up here it's just the positioning lights, which continue down here, but your brake lights, indicators and fogs all live here. You also get a piece of black trim that sort of frames the Volvo badging, which I just think makes this car look really smart. And even though this is ultimately, again, the entry-level Volvo and also the smallest Volvo currently available, it doesn't look like you've bought a cheap car, which I think is 
quite a trick given that again this car starts from well under 200,000 ringgit. Now despite the fact this car is relatively diminutive in size and rather recalcitrant in response, you will find a pretty good amount of space in the boot. Now if you ask me, if you're trying to put four, people, four adults in the car at least over say a road trip, you can put enough luggage back here for four people. However, if you're wondering whether or not this EX30 is as practical as every other Volvo ever made, we've actually previewed this car during that drive with 2,000 ringgits worth of IKEA products in the back, which was certainly large enough this car could fit all of it and still have enough room for two passengers to sit quite comfortably, which means that this is as practical as any other Volvo that's come before it. Now, underneath the boot floor, you will find a pretty decent amount of space, certainly big enough to hold all your charging cables and various other things. And in fact, this boot floor can actually be lowered in order to maximize space. So what you see here isn't even the full capacity. And of course, the rear seats can be folded 60-40 for added practicality, which means that you can load quite a bit of stuff in this. So the size really doesn't matter. Now, Volvo has got this whole sustainability bent, which is why this interior is very different from anything we've seen before. So for starters, these seats are no longer upholstered in Nappa leather. Instead, this is a sort of weird material that's not quite leather or even faux leather. But this bit in the middle is apparently made out of recycled denim. So, you know, if you've owned jeans in the last 20 years, they might have arrived here at some point. Now, beyond that, you also get more recycled PET bottles making up this material down here but then everything above that is very different. So for starters, you've got this lovely blue material here, and then you've got some soft touch materials up here, which I think look quite nice and promise to be quite hard wearing. On top of that, you've also got these very plasticky sort of air conditioning vents, but although the materials are not that nice, I will admit that aesthetically they look very pretty. In fact, there's something about them that reminds me of 70s Volvos for some reason, but I do appreciate the use of like this sort of clear kind of bluey plastic. It just looks very nice. That blue material extends onto the door cards where you will find a set of solid metal door handles, which is always nice, with more of that metal sort of extending back here. And you've got more of that recycled PET material here, the recycled denim down here, as well as these lovely soft armrests, which all just looks and feels nice to use. Now, beyond that, you will find a not quite circular, not quite square steering wheel, which is also a redesign from what we've seen from other Volvos in the past. Now, what's slightly irritating about this is as a result of the redesign of the steering wheel, it's not the shape I take issue with, it's the buttons, because Volvo steering wheels previously had a nice sort of setup of buttons which were very easy for you to figure out. You could look at them and in a single glance understand what all these buttons do. But with this, in, no, not so much. So for starters, on the right is what controls your media, on the left is what controls your active safety systems. But because these are all sort of multi-function buttons, they, they do lots of different things. And so sometimes it's sort of difficult to figure out what they do. But it is a matter of context and so for example, if you're trying to trigger the adaptive cruise control that uses the gear selector on this side and then this controls your speed. The distance is controlled in the screen, which we'll get onto a little bit later. Now, beyond the steering wheel, however, we have also lost any form of instrumentation. Now, we've seen this before from Tesla, but also from Mini, where they have that massive OLED screen here, and then they just put a heads-up display here, which doesn't then necessitate the use of an instrument cluster up ahead of you. However, in the EX30, no matter if you get the Plus or the Ultra, there is no heads-up display. So all the information that you usually find here is now here. Now this portrait style system is similar to what we've seen before from Census, but this is a Google automotive system. And so the infotainment system and user interface is very different from what we've seen before, but Volvo has had their little tweaks as to how it presents itself. And so they promise that this is still a Volvo experience. I'll get into that a little bit later. So all the information that you need for driving lives on a band up here, and that includes your gear selector status, your door opening warnings, your speed, ADAS functionalities, everything lives up on this little band here. And so even if you hit the indicators, that comes up there. Left or right, it's just here. And so it does require some adjustment because if you're used to having driven a normal car at any point in your life, you'd be used to looking for the instrumentation here, but now it's here. And it's also very small, which means you really need to get used to this or have full faith in the car. 
Now, as for the rest of the screen, the usability is not that bad. It's quite responsive, this thing. It's got a pretty decent processor in it as well, which means that all of your inputs are moved about, or rather they're, they're put into focus and they're put into action very quickly. So that's quite nice to have. The only trouble that I have with this is that because this is a Google automotive system, it doesn't offer Android Auto, which means that having to use your maps, your Spotify, your YouTube, etc., all require the use of the car's data plan. Now, of course, all new Volvos come with free data for five years. It's bundled into the cost of the car. However, Volvo Car Malaysia has yet to provide any detail as to how much this subscription will cost once those five years are up. And I personally do not like the idea of having to continue to pay for a subscription service in order to use functions that ought to come in my car. What's even more irritating is that even though this doesn't come with Android Auto, it does come with Apple CarPlay. So in order for me not to pay Volvo, I now have to buy an Apple. Now, because this screen controls all the functions, it is a good thing that is at least very responsive because, for example, to open the glove box, you press on the screen. To open the boot, that's on the screen. To adjust the ADAS functionalities, that's on the screen. Everything lives here because, as you can tell, there are no buttons anywhere else. Mercifully, however, there are buttons for the windows, but they are in the middle and there are only two, which means that to control the rear windows, you actually have to press a button and then use the same control. So if you're trying to open all four windows very quickly, good luck to you. Your lock and unlock buttons are also here, but these are all touch sensitive. Now, if you ask me, I think this is an unnecessary amount of cost cutting because these buttons could have been integrated into this armrest here. At least even just the front window controls could have been here because I know how difficult it is and how challenging it is to try and figure out where the the window controls are when you're at a toll plaza. Now, during the preview drive of this car, that is exactly what happened to me on several occasions throughout the day. But again, I suppose this is something that you will get used to over time. Now, in terms of practicality, as I mentioned earlier, there is a centrally mounted glove box here. The reason why this is here is because it's not only easier to access for the driver, it also means that more knee room can be freed up for the front passenger, allowing more space in the second row. But if you want even more space, there's actually an expandable center armrest here which you can have at multiple levels and of course once you have expanded it and I must admit that it does that very convincingly with a nice thud to it you also have these cup holders which you can slide in and out depending on whether or not you just want a space or you want cup holders which I think is quite nice you have a wireless charging pad here you have another panel down here just to hold your phone I suppose all of this is nicely rubberized and so your devices don't end up running around and then in the center console you have a dual floor system because underneath that floor you'll find a couple of USB-C ports and more rubberized storage but if you want to hide things you can just close the floor leave the cable coming out and then you have even more space here which I think is quite nice now as a result of this fancy system here we don't have a closed glove box here but I can assure you there is more space which we'll explore once we're in the back now if you're wondering where to put large bottles well we have a oh that's open we have a large bottle here which as you can see fits very nicely into the door pockets and because this car doesn't have any speakers on the door itself it also means that there is plenty of space in here for you to put say an iPad or a laptop and yes you heard me correctly there are no speakers on the doors not on the front or in fact in the rear because all of the sounds in this car come from a single piece Harman Kardon soundbar which lives between the dash and the windscreen now, in terms of the effectivity of that, well, I have to say that setting in the front, it is quite convincing. The sound does seem quite enveloping and it is, of course, a high quality sound. It's just that if you're sat in the back, that's not so great, even though there is a setting in here that allows the soundbar apparently to focus for better acoustic quality in the rear. Although I think that's just lip service to get away with not putting speakers back there. Oh, the other thing I quite like, we do have frameless wing mirrors outside, but we also have a frameless mirror in here. And so I do quite like that everything that I look at for safety has a very homogenous kind of look to it. It's nice. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the EX30 is quite a compact car, which is why I sat back here in behind myself, about 170 centimeters. As you can see, I don't have that much knee room, but I do have a decent amount of headroom given the fact that this is a plus model and therefore does not come with the glass roof. Although in the Ultra, because the roof doesn't open and there isn't a fixed sunshade or automatic sunshade, there isn't that much of a compromise in terms of headroom back here. Now, in terms of the overall space, I can admit that this is decently comfortable in terms of knee and headroom. The trouble as I'm no, I've no doubt you can see by now is actually in terms of under thigh support because you can see the floor in this car is quite high. You don't notice it in the front because the front seats are set up quite high but in the back you can tell that there's really not that much room here. On top of that the 
seat bases have been shortened somewhat to give it the illusion of space. And so in order to get any degree of under-thigh support, you really have to stretch out and pray that the guy in front of you has the seat jacked up high, otherwise you're pretty much screwed. On top of that, even stretched out like this, as you can see, I need to spread rather ungainly. Because if I were to sit like this, again, I still don't have under-thigh support. This is quite a compromised back end. However, Volvo says the EX30 is not really made for family use. This is more for young up-and-coming types who want their first luxury car and so they'll mostly be using the second row seats anyway or will be using this back seat primarily for young children. Now to that end there are obviously isofix mounts back here and so if you put a front-facing child seat there shouldn't be an issue at all. However if you try to fit a rear-facing child seat you will discover that because of this car's relatively small dimensions you will end up pushing the front seat as you've set it up nicely. You might need to put that in the passenger seat in order to make for greater clearance and the doors don't open all that wide which means getting the seat in and out is going to be a trouble in and of itself. Now if you do have slightly older children with front-facing seats and therefore their own electronic devices you will be glad to see there are a couple of USB-C ports back here as well as space underneath that center console for their stuff because you get this removable space with a little mousse here which I think is quite cute but more importantly this allows you to put more of their stuff away and out of sight. That also helps because there are no pockets on the backs of the seats, but there are at least decently sized door bins, which I think are all right. Now, what also irritates me as an adult passenger back here is that I do not have a center armrest. As I mentioned earlier, these rear seats fold 60-40, which means you can't even fold the center seat in order to have a makeshift armrest. You just get nothing. But if you can slouch a little bit, like that, I suppose it's kind of all right. I suppose you could also use your knees to irritate the driver in front of you should you so want to. But ultimately, if we were to evaluate this car based on how Volvo thinks it ought to be used, then suddenly even this base EX30 isn't so bad. Now, just to reiterate, the car that we're driving today is the EX30 Plus, which represents the entry-level EX30, and now also the most affordable Volvo currently on sale. Now, again, you may be led to believe that because this is an entry-level car, that means there is some degree of compromise. As I mentioned earlier, in terms of exterior and interior specifications, you aren't really losing much. If you were to opt for the Ultra, you get powered front seats, but that's about it. Everything else remains broadly the same. And so, to me, that justifies the entry-level model a little bit more. Because yes, while electric seats are nice, it's not like you get leather. So, might as well just live with some manual seats and enjoy the rest of the car. And while talking about enjoying the rest of the car, there is a lot of this car to enjoy. So for starters, as I mentioned earlier, because this is a rear-wheel drive or two-wheel drive vehicle, it is powered by the rear. And so you do have that sensation of being pushed forward rather than being pulled as you were in a front-wheel drive vehicle. On top of that, it also means that the front wheels are not too busy doing other things other than steering. And so you do get a surprisingly good response and a surprisingly good amount of feedback from the steering wheel. Surprising given that this is not only an electric car, but it's also a modern car with electric power steering. So that's always nice to have. On top of that, when you do take this car up to a certain amount of speed, you will also then very quickly be able to discern that this car is built to the same sort of quality and standards that you would always expect from a Volvo. What that means is road noise is very, very well suppressed and wind noise is surprisingly well addressed in this car. So much so that even north the national speed limit, you will struggle to get that much noise coming into the cabin. I've no doubt that these Goodyear tires are doing a very good job at maintaining a reasonable NVH level in here, as well as these frameless wing mirrors as, and the very well profiled doors and door windows. And as you move along, in addition to this car being very quiet, that's when you really appreciate the quality in this car. Because it's built to Volvo standards, it means that everything is just screwed together so tightly with very minimal tolerances. And it just means that this car feels like a luxury car. This feels like an upmarket vehicle. It may be affordable, sure, but it sure is, doesn't feel affordable in here. This car just feels like a big, expensive Volvo shrunken. 
Now, this of course benefits in many different ways. So for example, if you drive this car in town, you'll appreciate its diminutive size. It means it's easier to park, it's easier to thread through traffic, it's a lot easier to negotiate, especially in the center of town where roads are surprisingly narrow. And because this car is so well insulated, it also means that, for example, you will not be bothered by bikes or lorries and stuff like that as they blow past you because you're in your serene little cocoon. And of course, that's even before you get onto that Harman Kardon soundbar, which can even further isolate you within this cabin and keep you further removed from the world around you. Now, what aids in that isolation is this car's ADAS functionalities. Now, that's because even though this is again an entry-level Volvo, this is not entry-level in terms of safety specifications because obviously Volvo never compromises in that regard. So this car comes with a full gamut of Volvo's safety systems, which is called IntelliSafe. So that means you get things like adaptive cruise control, autonomous emergency braking, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert. You get emergency lane keep assist, lane centering assist, and so on and so forth. All the things necessary in order to make this a really good car to live with when you're driving about in town because the car can do the majority of the work for you. And of course, when you're driving at higher speeds out of town on the motorway, you'll also appreciate the way this car handles itself through higher speed scenarios. The lane centering, for example, isn't quite as capable as what you've seen from, for example, Tesla or x but it is at least capable enough in order to take away the majority of the strain of driving. And when you're in town, you can essentially just monitor what the car is doing and let the car do the work. That, to me, makes this a consummate city car, something that you can indeed live with on a regular basis without too many issues at all. However, that does bring me on to the few things about the EX30 Plus that I'm not the biggest fan of. So you've already heard me moan about Google Automotive. I think that just goes without saying, and I've said that multiple times in various different Volvo reviews. However, what bothers me currently about this Google Automotive system in this particular car is that for whatever reason, it's decided that Waze is an entertainment app, which means that as soon as the car starts moving, it, it doesn't work. Now, I have mentioned this to Volvo Car Malaysia. They have admitted that it is some sort of a glitch and they are working on trying to fix that. But of course, I have the ability to talk directly to the OEM. I can't imagine that most customers would have that same kind of access. And so I would imagine, therefore, that the rectification work for a glitch like that would then take longer if I were just a customer. So that isn't great at all. Then we move into this car's 360-degree cameras, or lack thereof. Now, yes, I understand this is an entry-level Volvo, and yes, I understand that this is about 188,000 ringgit, making it the most affordable Volvo in recent history. However, not including a 360 cam in the base model like this does feel a little bit um, mean because I can't imagine that 360 cams cost all that much. At least it's not so much so that it would bother the average Volvo customer. And so removing the 360 cam and leaving this with just a reverse camera does feel a little bit cheap. And it also cheapens the experience for someone who may be trying a Volvo for the first time, buying their first luxury vehicle, for example, going into the showroom and test driving one of these, because they look at that and think, oh, most other cars come with 360 cams, this one doesn't. Now, speaking from the perspective of someone who might be buying their first Volvo or considering the EX30 as their first luxury vehicle, is an important perspective to bear in mind, because that, exa that is exactly what Volvo envisions for the EX30. They believe that this is the car that will convert more customers to either transition into a luxury car or transition into the Volvo brand for the first time. They also see that this might be a car that might appeal to families that might already have a larger Volvo available, but want something smaller for younger members of the family, say kids with their first car, for example very privileged children, no doubt, and I'm certainly sure they're aware of that. But that is certainly a market. We've seen that already occur with the XC40, where certain parents with XC90s or S90s have purchased XC40s for their younger children. And so the EX30 aim, is aimed squarely at that market too. And I think that for a first-time luxury car buyer, there is a lot in this car to impress. The build quality, the refinement, and the overall integration of technology in this car is a very clear Volvo hallmark, something that other brands can't really match. Not even an entry-level Audi builds cars up to these sort of standards, and so this does feel very convincing as a luxury car, albeit one in the entry-level space. 
However, younger buyers are also more easily convinced by flashier things and Volvo has never really been one to do flashy things. For example, the ambient lighting system in here is not customizable. There are preset moods and you just have to live with those. You press the buttons and you choose what kind of color scape and mood you want, but that's it. There is no 64 color multi-functional selectable ambient lighting system. You can't get it to beat with the music. You can't get it to extend into weird places in the car. Even the presentation of the ambient lighting system itself is also very muted. On top of that, because this car only has one screen, it also means that there are less things to draw the eye, especially when you're in a showroom. As a result, I do feel that entry-level luxury car buyers may be more easily swayed by, say, a Mercedes-Benz A-Class Saloon or even a 2 Series Grand Coupe because those cars appeal to a younger set of buyers with the way those cars are set up and designed. The same goes, in fact, even for lower-end models from lower-end brands. The BYD Seal, for example, certainly has a little bit more going for it visually in terms of what to look at and the various things that will pop out at you. And of course, the seal is also slightly more affordable with better range and is also rear wheel drive with a longer wheelbase. But that is beside the point. If you were to compare this to vehicles like the Smart Hashtag One, for example, that seems to me like a car that is clearly geared towards a younger set of buyers. If you compare this to the Zika X, now that is for someone who's more into slightly more avant-garde design. The Volvo EX30 is very pared back in a very Volvo kind of way. And it does require a certain kind of person to appreciate that kind of quality and that kind of attention to detail. If, for example, you are an older customer, say you currently drive an E-Class or an S-Class and you're looking for something to downsize into as you age, then the EX30 might appeal to you because you're the kind of customer that would be able to appreciate Volvo's attention to detail in this car. But that's not what Volvo envisioned. And so I am a bit confused in terms of how this car is going to appeal to the market. And then there is, of course, the size. Because this is not a very large car, it does also mean that if you're buying this car as, say, a young family, for example, you might quickly find yourself growing out of this car. Your demands for additional space in terms of both boot space as well as for passengers might quickly increase beyond this. But Volvo Car Malaysia also says the EX30 is meant or primarily targeted at people looking to buy an additional car. This is a second car for a lot of people in this country and so that might be where it appeals most. So ultimately, I do think the EX30 has its solid points, especially this plus model. Because yes, you might not have electric seats or particularly fancy interior upholstery, but this is a convincing luxury car and it's a convincing EV at that. And given that this car has slightly better dynamics than what we've seen from other brands within this space, I do think that there is a certain kind of appeal here. It's just a matter of whether or not its target customers will take attention to the EX30 at all. This is a car that I would recommend because I appreciate the sort of luxury that's being made available within this car. This appeals to me as a luxury car primarily. However, if you do want something that's a bit more flashy, then again, you may be easily swayed by the smart hashtag one, or indeed, in fact, the hashtag three. Because while those cars use the same platform and compromise in other areas, it does appear to be a bit more impressive, a bit more flashy, a bit more in your face with its technology and with its tilt towards a younger set of buyers. However, if you'd prefer a slightly more traditional brand on the nose, you may be better swayed by the BMW iX1 or iX2, or in fact, even the Mini or Mini Countryman. Both of those are now available as electric vehicles, and so they do broadly appeal to the same market as the EX30. But of the lot, as unbelievable as this might sound, I am actually most impressed by this, not just by its entry-level price point, but also by the sheer amount of quality they managed to build in here despite that price point. On top of that, at the end of 2025, when the tax incentives expire for fully imported EVs, the EX30 will continue to be priced at this point, if not cheaper still, because this car is already being assembled here in Shah Alam rather than being fully imported, which is something that other brands will have to struggle with. And so when you put all of that together, this may be a car which reveals its value later, not immediately. And that is certainly something to bear in mind should you take this car out for a test drive in the near future. But in any case, that concludes our review of the Volvo EX30 Plus. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell icon to notify every time we make a new upload. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. We will catch you in the next one. Take care, stay safe and jangan bodoh.